America needs more energy. Our opponent is against producing it. Once again, I'm not hearing too much from Palin and McCain about the drill, baby, drill, with the big oil spill going on. Let me be specific. The Democratic nominee for president supports plans to raise income taxes, raise payroll taxes, raise investment income taxes, raise the death tax, raise business tax, and raise the tax burden on American people by hundreds of billions of dollars. Do you realize what the hell you're talking about? Correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure that he only would raise taxes on people who are making more money than they need, like a quarter of a million, and not raising taxes on people who aren't making as much. I was nearly finished, but now I was getting the Tom to the Tom Mo part. I steeled myself and began talking about the journey of John McCain, an upright and honorable man. The kind of fellow whose name you'll find on war memorials in small towns across this great country. Only he was among those who came home to the most powerful office on earth. He would bring the compassion that comes from having once been the powerless, the wisdom that gives even to the captives by the grace of God. The crowd erupted again with cheers and applause for our candidate. The, specific, the special confidence of those who had seen evil and seen how evil is overcome. My throat tightened. Thankfully, I was able to pause as more applause thundered through the hall, honoring America's veterans. It gave me time to brace myself and plunge in, even though my throat closed even tighter. A fellow, fellow prisoner of war, a man named Tom Moe of Lancaster, Ohio. Now the applause was definitely an extended. Okay, will you, will you cut it out with the self-glorification? And then they applauded more, and then they applauded even more, and then they broke out and erupted with cheers! Uh, let's see, more self-appreciation, more self-glorification, blah, blah, blah. His friends were ecstatic, and I could make out what they were saying. He's here, this is Tom Moe. This brave man had suffered vicious torture at the hands of North Vietnamese. Vietnamese. Like John, he had been locked in tiny cells for five years with rats, bugs, excrement, brokenness, and constant pain. I knew it would only be by the grace of God that I would make it through the next part of our message because words and a speech don't do our veterans justice. Tom Moe recalls looking through a pinhole in his cell door as a lieutenant commander John McCain was led down a hallway by the guards day after day. I continued, and the story is told. When McCain shuffled back from the torturous interrogations, he would turn towards Moe's door, and he'd flash a grin and thumbs up as if to say we're going to pull through this. My fellow Americans, this is the kind of man America needs to see us through the next four years. Seeing Tom Moe standing there made our message about national greatness so real. This wasn't campaign hype. Yes, it is. Here was an authentic American hero standing right in front of me. I had no idea he was going to be here. It was an honor to be in his presence. I'm not sure how the next lines flowed because I was so overwhelmed with American pride that the rest of the speech was a blur. You are so full of yourself. I had never seen a replay of that night, but I remember that as soon as I wrapped up the speech, I looked around for Todd and the kids to join me on stage. They had argued over who would get to carry trick. It was a good thing that Piper lost the argument and had her hands free so that she could pump her fist up in the air and wave hello against the world. Immediately after the speech, John surprised everyone by joining us on stage and embracing my family. I was so proud of them. The kids looked great, even in a bunch of borrowed clothes. The next night, John accepted the nomination. My family and I walked with John's mom, the precious and resilient Miss Roberta McCain, to join him on stage. As I headed down the stairs and towards the stage area, my right heel shoe fell off. Great, I thought, figuring the media caught my first stumble. But if they did, they didn't broadcast it around the world. Bless their hearts. Wow, a shot that wasn't at the media. Chapter 7 of Chapter 4 During the convention, yet another story bubbled up in the Washington press. It was about state troopers and Wal Walton Modingham. The story eventually achieved proper noun status. Troopergate, or as or as those who knew the facts called it, Kazergate. I was heartened I was heartened to see that by September four, you need to add like a third and a fourth, not just have the number. This is basic writing, Palin, come on. 
on the last day of the convention, Investors Business Daily had already seen the handwriting on the wall. An unbyline op-ed on the editorial page said this, Palin's political enemies have a stink bomb set to go off late in October, just before the election. That's when voters will see the fruits of a legislative investigation into the charge of what the governor fired Alaska Public Safety Commissioner Walter Monaghan because he wouldn't get rid of Mike Wooten, a state trooper and Palin's ex-brother-in-law. We could all see where this was headed. Palin will be found to have done something illegal in firing Monaghan, since the public safety commissioners serve at the governor's pleasure. But the media will frame this case in vague and sinister terms. Think abuse of power. It will only bury the backstory that can explains why Palin is so concerned. Yeah, I'm going to count that as two separate complaints because it's kind of split, but I digress. The op laid out the key facts. The troopers' marriages and divorce by this time, there were four. His threat that my father would eat an effing lead bullet if he hired a lawyer for Molly, his tasering my nephew, and other unethical and illegal behavior, including hunt or hunting wild game illegally. And a big deal a big deal in Alaska, where people ethically harvest game to eat. IBD also noted that the finding of Alaska State Trooper Director Colonel Julia Grimes that the state troopers' actions demonstrate a serious and concentrated pattern of unacceptable at times, illegal activity occurring over a lengthy period, which establishes a course of conduct totally at odds with ethics of our profession. She also warned him, IBD noted, that he would be fired if he didn't shape up. Now ask yourself this. If, Sarah, if you were Sarah Palin and had such a revealing look at Wooden, wouldn't you wanted him on the fort? That. If you were Sarah Palin and had such a revealing look at Wooten, would you have wanted him on the force? Palin was acting as any concerned citizen should after a close encounter with an unfit cop. If there's abuse of power in the story, it lies on the side of bureaucrats and unions protecting officers whose behavior makes them a danger to the public. In 444 words, the IDD editorial board had explained the essence of an eventful outcome of a case in which the state of Alaska would spend half a million taxpayer dollars and the mainstream media would spill untold gallons of ink. It's, it would have saved everyone a lot of time if they'd just read IBD and moved on, but unfortunately, no election cycle is complete without throbbing a drumbeat of scandal to distract voters from the issues, even if no political have to gin one up. Oh, even if politicos have to Politicos have to gin one up. Why is she using weird words? This isn't making her sound smart. As we hit the road, three of the campaign staffers I had met during the convention would become friends. Jason Retcher, a special assistant to President Bush, took leave from the White House and joined us for a couple days in. A dyed in wool New Englander from an Irish Catholic family. Jason, 29, had two choices while growing up in New Hampshire sports or politics. He chose politics. I didn't hold that against him. He shined as a volunteer during the 2000 primary and became permanent member of the Bush team at age 19. Jason was a calming presence on the trail and was very kind to our kids. Jeannie Eckhart, one of our trip coordinators, was a beautiful, soft-spoken young lady from Minnesota. We wore the same size clothes. Uh, how do you know that? And as the weeks went on, she would keep loaning me her Black Theory pants that she had bought four years earlier. I kept telling her to find a duplicate pair on the internet, and I would order them for her because I was wearing hers out. My daughters instantly loved Jeannie's sense of style and enjoyed hanging with her and another one of her assistants, Bexy Nobles. A quiet country gal from Texas, Bexy was tireless and at great anticipation and great at anticipating what we need next on the trail. Okay, just a quick question for you people out there before I end this. Are you keeping track of all the names of people that she's mentioning? Because I'm not. And it's all, because if you aren't like me, why would you think this is all necessary? Personally, I think it's just to extend the length of the book but whatever.